the ten million pound banknote and other stories by mark twain chapter two this librivox recording is in the public domain the ten million dollar banknote and other stories by mark twain chapter two mental telegraphy a manuscript with a history note to the editor by glancing over the enclosed bundle of rusty old manuscript, you will perceive that I once made a great discovery, the discovery that certain sorts of things, which, from the beginning of the world, had always been regarded as merely curious coincidences, that is to say, accidents, were no more accidental than is the sending and receiving of a telegram an accident. I made this discovery sixteen or seventeen years ago, and gave it a name, mental telegraphy. It is the same thing around the outer edges of which the Physical Society of England began to grope and play with four or five years ago, and which they named telepathy. Within the last two or three years they have penetrated toward the heart of the matter, however, and have found out that mind can act upon mind in a quite detailed and elaborate way over vast stretches of land and water and they have succeeded in doing by their great credit and influence what i could never have done they have convinced the world that mental telegraphy is not a jest but a fact and that it is a thing not rare but exceedingly common they have done our age a service and a very great service i think in this old manuscript you will find mention of an extraordinary experience of mine in the mental telegraphic line of date about the year eighteen seventy four or eighteen seventy five the one concerning the great bonanza book it was this experience that called my attention to the matter under consideration i began to keep a record after that of such experiences of mine as seemed explicable by the theory that minds telegraph thoughts to each other in eighteen seventy eight i went to germany and began to write the book called a tramp abroad the bulk of this old batch of manuscript was written at that time and for that book but i removed it when i came to revise the volume for the press for I feared that the public would treat the thing as a joke and throw it aside, whereas I was in earnest. At home, eight or ten years ago, I tried to creep in under shelter of an authority grave enough to protect the article from ridicule, the North American Review. But Mr. Metcalf was too wary for me. He said that to treat these mere coincidences seriously was a thing which the Review couldn't dare to do that i must put either my name or my nom de plume to the article and thus save the review from harm but i couldn't consent to that it would be the surest possible way to defeat my desire that the public should receive the thing seriously and be willing to stop and give it some fair degree of attention so i pigeonholed the manuscript because i could not get it published anonymously now we see how the world has moved since then these small experiences of mine, which were too formidable at that time for admission to a grave magazine, if the magazine must allow them to appear as something above and beyond accidents and coincidences, are trifling and commonplace now, since the flood of light recently cast upon mental telegraphy by the intelligent labors of the physical society, but I think they are worth publishing just to show what harmless and ordinary matters were considered dangerous and incredible eight or ten years ago as i have said the bulk of this old manuscript was written in eighteen seventy eight a later part was written from time to time two three and four years afterward the postscript i add to-day may seventy eight Another of those apparently trifling things has happened to me which puzzle and perplex all men every now and then, keep them thinking an hour or two, and leave their minds barren of explanation or solution at last. Here it is, and it looks inconsequential enough, I am obliged to say. A few days ago I said, 
it must be that frank millet doesn't know we are in germany or he would have written long before this i have been on the point of dropping him a line at least a dozen times during the past six weeks but i always decided to wait a day or two longer and see if we shouldn't hear from him but now i will write and so i did i directed the letter to paris and thought now we shall hear from him before this letter is fifty miles from heidelberg it always happens so true enough but why should it that is the puzzling part of it we are always talking about letters crossing each other for that is one of the very commonest accidents of this life we call it accident but perhaps we misname it we have the instinct a dozen times a year that the letter we are writing is going to cross the other person's letter and if the reader will rack his memory a little he will recall the fact that this presentiment had strength enough to it to make him cut his letter down to a decided briefness because it would be a waste of time to write a letter which was going to cross and hence be a useless letter i think that in my experience this instinct has generally come to me in cases where i had put off my letter a good while in the hope that the other person would write yes as i was saying i had waited five or six weeks then i wrote but three lines because i felt and seemed to know that a letter from millet would cross mine and so it did he wrote the same day that i wrote the letters crossed each other his letter went to berlin care of the american minister who sent it to me in this letter millet said he had been trying for six weeks to stumble upon somebody who knew my german address and at last the idea had occurred to him that a letter sent to the care of the embassy at berlin might possibly find me maybe it was an accident that he finally determined to write me at the same moment that i finally determined to write him but i think not with me the most irritating thing has been to wait a tedious time in a purely business matter hoping that the other party will do the writing and then sit down and do it myself perfectly satisfied that that other man is sitting down at the same moment to write a letter which will cross mine and yet one must go on writing just the same because if you get up from your table and postpone that other man will do the same thing exactly as if you two were harnessed together like the siamese twins and must duplicate each other's movements several months before i left home a new york firm did some work about the house for me and did not make a success of it as it seemed to me when the bill came i wrote and said i wanted the work perfected before i paid they replied that they were very busy but that as soon as they could spare the proper man the thing should be done i waited more than two months enduring as patiently as possible the companionship of bells which would fire away of their own accord sometimes when nobody was touching them and at other times wouldn't ring though you stuck the button with a sledgehammer many a time i got ready to write and then postponed it but at last i sat down one evening and poured out my grief to the extent of a page or so and then cut my letter suddenly short because a strong instinct told me that the firm had begun to move in the matter when i came down to breakfast next morning the postman had not yet taken my letter away but the electrical man had been there done his work and was gone again he had received his orders the previous evening from his employers and had come up by the night train if that was an accident it took about three months to get it up in good shape one evening last summer i arrived in washington registered at the arlington hotel and went to my room i read and smoked until ten o'clock then finding i was not yet sleepy i thought i would take a breath of fresh air so i went forth in the rain and tramped through one street after the other in an aimless and enjoyable way i knew that mr o a friend of mine was in town and i wished i might run across him but i did not propose to hunt for him at midnight especially as i did not know where he was stopping toward twelve o'clock the streets had become so deserted that i felt lonesome so i stepped into a cigar shop far up the avenue and remained there fifteen minutes 
listening to some bummers discussing national politics suddenly the spirit of prophecy came upon me and i said to myself now i will go out at this door turn to the left walk ten steps and meet mr o face to face i did it too i could not see his face because he had an umbrella before it and it was pretty dark anyhow but he interrupted the man he was walking and talking with and i recognized his voice and stopped him that i should step out there and stumble upon mr o was nothing but that i should know beforehand that i was going to do it was a good deal it is a very curious thing when you come to look at it i stood far within the cigar shop when i delivered my prophecy i walked about five steps to the door opened it closed it after me walked down a flight of three steps to the sidewalk then turned to the left and walked four or five more and found my man i repeat that in itself the thing was nothing but to know it would happen so beforehand wasn't that really curious i have criticized absent people so often and then discovered to my humiliation that i was talking with their relatives that i have grown superstitious about that sort of thing and dropped it how like an idiot one feels after a blunder like that we are always mentioning people and in that very instant they appear before us we laugh and say speak of the devil and so forth and there we drop it considering it an accident it is a cheap and convenient way of disposing of a grave and very puzzling mystery the fact is it does seem to happen too often to be an accident now i come to the oldest thing that ever happened to me two or three years ago i was lying in bed idly musing one morning it was the second of march when suddenly a red-hot new idea came whistling down into my camp and exploded with such comprehensive effectiveness as to sweep the vicinity clean of rubbishy reflections and fill the air with their dust and flying fragments this idea stated in simple phrase was that the time was ripe and the market ready for a certain book a book which must command attention and be of peculiar interest to wit a book about the nevada silver mines the great bonanza was a new wonder then and everybody was talking about it it seemed to me that the person best qualified to write this book was mr william h wright a journalist of virginia nevada by whose side i had scribbled many months when i was a reporter there ten or twelve years before he might be alive still he might be dead i could not tell but i would write him anyway i began by merely and modestly suggesting that he make such a book but my interest grew as i went on and i ventured to map out what i thought ought to be the plan of the work he being an old friend and not given to taking good intentions for ill i even dealt with details and suggested the order and sequence which they should follow i was about to put the manuscript in an envelope when the thought occurred to me that if this book should be written at my suggestion and then no publisher happened to want it i should feel uncomfortable so i concluded to keep my letter back until i should have secured a publisher i pigeonholed my document and dropped a note to my own publisher asking him to name a day for a business consultation he was out of town on a far journey my note remained unanswered and at the end of three or four days the whole matter had passed out of my mind on the ninth of march the postman brought three or four letters and among them a thick one whose superscription was in a hand which seemed dimly familiar to me i could not place it at first but presently i succeeded then i said to a visiting relative who was present now i will do a miracle i will tell you everything this letter contains date signature and all without breaking the seal it is from mr wright of virginia nevada and is dated march second seven days ago mr wright proposes to make a book about the silver mines and the great bonanza and asks what i as a friend think of the idea he says his subjects are to be so-and-so their order and sequence so-and-so 
and he will close with a history of the chief feature of the book, the Great Bonanza. I opened the letter and showed that I had stated the date and the contents correctly. Mr. Wright's letter simply contained what my own letter, written on the same date, contained, and mine still lay in its pigeonhole, where it had been lying during the seven days since it was written. There was no clairvoyance about this, if I rightly comprehend what clairvoyance is. I think the clairvoyant professes to actually see concealed writing, and read it off word for word. This was not my case. I only seemed to know, and to know absolutely, the contents of the letter in detail and due order, but I had to word them myself. I translated them, so to speak, out of Wright's language into my own. Wright's letter and the one which I had written to him, but never sent, were in substance the same. Necessarily this could not come by accident. Such elaborate accidents cannot happen. Chance might have duplicated one or two of the details, but she would have broken down on the rest. I could not doubt, there was no tenable reason for doubting, that Mr. Wright's mind and mine had been in close and crystal-clear communication with each other across three thousand miles of mountain and desert on the morning of March 2nd. I did not consider that both minds originated that succession of ideas, but that one mind originated them, and simply telegraphed them to the other. I was curious to know which brain was the telegrapher and which the receiver, so I wrote and asked for particulars. Mr. Wright's reply showed that his mind had done the originating and telegraphing, and mine the receiving. Mark that significant thing now. Consider for a moment how many a splendid original idea has been unconsciously stolen from a man three thousand miles away. If one should question that this is so, let him look into the cyclopedia, and con once more that curious thing in the history of inventions which has puzzled every one so much, that is, the frequency with which the same machine or other contrivance has been invented at the same time by several persons in different quarters of the globe. The world was without an electric telegraph for several thousand years. Then Professor Henry, the American, Wheatstone in England, Morse on the sea, and a German in Munich, all invented it at the same time. The discovery of certain ways of applying steam was made in two or three countries in the same year. Is it not possible that inventors are constantly and unwittingly stealing each other's ideas whilst they stand thousands of miles asunder? Last spring a literary friend of mine, W. D. Howells, who lived a hundred miles away, paid me a visit, and in the course of our talk he said he had made a discovery, conceived an entirely new idea, one which certainly had never been used in literature. He told me what it was. I handed him a manuscript, and said he would find substantially the same idea in that, a manuscript which I had written a week before. The idea had been in my mind since the previous November. It had only entered his while I was putting it on paper, a week gone by. He had not yet written his, so he left it unwritten, and gracefully made over all his right and title in the idea to me. The following statement, which I have clipped from a newspaper, is true. I had the facts from Mr. Howell's lips when the episode was new. A remarkable story of a literary coincidence is told of Mr. Howell's Atlantic monthly serial, Dr. Breen's Practice. A lady of Rochester, New York, contributed to the magazine, after Dr. Breen's practice was in type, a short story which so much resembled Mr. Howells's that he felt it necessary to call upon her and explain the situation of affairs in order that no charge of plagiarism might be preferred against him. He showed her the proof-sheets of his story, and satisfied her that the similarity between her work and his was one of those strange coincidences which have from time to time occurred in the literary world. I had read portions of Mr. Howells's story, both in manuscript and in proof, before the lady offered her contribution to the magazine. 
here is another case i clip it from a newspaper the republication of miss alcott's novel moods recalls to a writer in the boston post a singular coincidence which was brought to light before the book was first published miss anna m crane of baltimore published emily chester a novel which was pronounced a very striking and strong story a comparison of this book with moods showed that the two writers though entire strangers to each other and living hundreds of miles apart had both chosen the same subject for their novels had followed almost the same line of treatment up to a certain point where the parallel ceased and the denouements were entirely opposite and even more curious the leading characters in both books had identically the same names so that the names in miss alcott's novel had to be changed then the book was published by loring four or five times within my recollection there has been a lively newspaper war in this country over poems whose authorship was claimed by two or three different people at the same time there was a war of this kind over nothing to wear beautiful snow rock me to sleep mother and also over one of mr wilde carleton's early ballads i think these were all blameless cases of unintentional and unwitting mental telegraphy i judge a word more as to mr wright he had had his book in his mind some time consequently he and not i had originated the idea of it the subject was entirely foreign to my thoughts i was wholly absorbed in other things yet this friend whom i had not seen and had hardly thought of for eleven years was able to shoot his thoughts at me across three thousand miles of country and fill my head with them to the exclusion of every other interest in a single moment he had begun his letter after finishing his work on the morning paper a little after three o'clock he said when it was three in the morning in nevada it was about six in hartford where i lay awake thinking about nothing in particular and just about that time his ideas came pouring into my head from across the continent and i got up and put them on paper under the impression that they were my own original thoughts i have never seen any mesmeric or clairvoyant performances or spiritual manifestations which were in the least degree convincing a fact which is not of consequence since my opportunities have been meagre but i am forced to believe that one human mind still inhabiting the flesh can communicate with another over any sort of a distance and without any artificial preparation of sympathetic conditions to act as a transmitting agent i suppose that when the sympathetic conditions happen to exist the two minds communicate with each other and that otherwise they don't and i suppose that if the sympathetic conditions could be kept up right along the two minds would continue to correspond without limit as to time now there is that curious thing which happens to everybody suddenly a succession of thoughts or sensations flock in upon you which startles you with the weird idea that you have ages ago experienced just this succession of thoughts or sensations in a previous existence the previous existence is possible no doubt but i am persuaded that the solution of this hoary mystery lies not there but in the fact that some far-off stranger has been telegraphing his thoughts and sensations into your consciousness and that he stopped because some counter-current or other obstruction intruded and broke the line of communication perhaps they seem repetitions to you because they are repetitions got at second hand from the other man possibly mr brown the mind reader reads other people's minds possibly he does not but i know of a surety that i have read another man's mind and therefore i do not see why mr brown shouldn't do the like also i wrote the foregoing about three years ago in heidelberg and laid the manuscript aside proposing to add to its instances of mind telegraphing from time to time as they should fall under my experience meantime the crossing of letters has been so frequent as to become monotonous however i have managed to get something useful out of this hint 
for now, when I get tired of waiting upon a man whom I very much wish to hear from, I sit down and compel him to write, whether he wants to or not. That is to say, I sit down and write him, and then tear my letter up, satisfied that my act has forced him to write me at the same moment. I do not need to mail my letter. The writing it is the only essential thing. Of course I have grown superstitious about this letter-crossing business. This was natural. We stayed a while in Venice after leaving Heidelberg. One day I was going down the Grand Canal in a gondola when I heard a shout behind me and looked around to see what the matter was. A gondola was rapidly following, and the gondolier was making signs to me to stop. I did so, and the pursuing boat ranged up alongside. There was an American lady in it, a resident of Venice. She was in a good deal of distress. She said, "'There's a New York gentleman and his wife at the Hotel Britannia who arrived a week ago, expecting to find news of their son, whom they have heard nothing about during eight months. There was no news. The lady is down sick with despair. The gentleman can't sleep or eat. Their son arrived at San Francisco eight months ago, and announced the fact in a letter to his parents the same day. That is the last trace of him. The parents have been in Europe ever since, but their trip has been spoiled, for they have occupied their time simply in drifting restlessly from place to place, and writing letters everywhere to everybody, begging for news of their son. But the mystery remains as dense as ever. Now the gentleman wants to stop writing and go to cabling. He wants to cable San Francisco. He has never done it before, because he is afraid of—of— of, he doesn't know what. Death of his son, no doubt. But he wants somebody to advise him to cable, wants me to do it. Now I, I simply can't, for if no news came, that mother would simply die. So I have chased you up in order to get you to support me in urging him to be patient and put the thing off a week or two longer. It may be the saving of this lady. Come along, let's not lose any time. So I went along, but I had a program of my own. When I was introduced to the gentleman, I said, I have some superstitions, but they are worthy of respect. If you will cable San Francisco immediately, you will hear news of your son inside of twenty-four hours. I don't know that you will get the news from San Francisco, but you will get it from somewhere. The only necessary thing is to cable, that is all. The news will come within twenty-four hours. Cable Peking, if you prefer. There is no choice in this matter. This delay is all occasioned by your not cabling long ago, when you were first moved to do it. It seemed absurd that this gentleman should have been cheered up by this nonsense, but he was. He brightened up at once, and sent his cablegram. And next day, at noon, when a long letter arrived from his lost son, the man was as grateful to me as if I had really had something to do with the hurrying up of that letter. The son had shipped from San Francisco in a sailing vessel, and his letter was written from the first port he touched at months afterwards. This incident argues nothing, and is valueless. I insert it only to show how strong is the superstition which letter-crossing has bred in me. I was so sure that a cablegram sent to any place, no matter where, would defeat itself by crossing the incoming news, that my confidence was able to raise up a hopeless man and make him cheery and hopeful. But here are two or three incidents which come strictly under the head of mine telegraphing One Monday morning, about a year ago, the mail came in and I picked up one of the letters and said to a friend, Without opening this letter, I will tell you what it says. It is from Mrs. Blank, and she says she was in New York last Saturday, and was proposing to run up here in the afternoon train and surprise us, but at the last moment changed her mind and returned westward to her home. I was right. My details were exactly correct. Yet we had had no suspicion that Mrs. Blank was coming to New York, or that she had even a remote intention of visiting us. I smoke a good deal, that is to say, all the time. So during seven years I have tried to keep a box of matches handy behind a picture on the mantelpiece, but I have had to take it out in trying, 
because george colored who makes the fires and lights the gas always uses my matches and never replaces them commands and persuasions have gone for nothing with him all these seven years one day last summer when our family had been away from home several months i said to a member of the household now with all this long holiday and nothing in the way to interrupt i can finish the sentence for you said the member of the household do it then said i george ought to be able by practicing to learn to let those matches alone it was correctly done that was what i was going to say yet until that moment george and the matches had not been in my mind for three months and it is plain that the part of the sentence which i uttered offers not the least cue or suggestion of what i was proposing to follow it with my mother she was still living when this was written is descended from the younger of two english brothers named lampton who settled in this country a few generations ago the tradition goes that the elder of the two eventually fell heir to a certain estate in england now an earldom and died right away this has always been the way with our family they always die when they could make anything by not doing it the two lamptons left plenty of lamptons behind them and when at last about fifty years ago the english baronetcy was exalted to an earldom the great tribe of american lamptons began to bestir themselves that is those descended from the elder branch ever since that day one or another of these has been fretting his life uselessly away with schemes to get at his rights the present rightful earl i mean the american one used to write me occasionally and try to interest me in his projected raids upon the title and estates by offering me a share in the latter portion of the spoil but i have always managed to resist his temptations well one day last summer i was lying under a tree thinking about nothing in particular when an absurd idea flashed into my head and i said to a member of the household suppose i should live to be ninety-two and dumb and blind and toothless and just as i was gasping out what was left of me on my deathbed wait i will finish the sentence said the member of the household go on said i somebody should rush in with a document and say all the other heirs are dead and you are the earl of durham that is truly what i was going to say yet until that moment the subject had not entered my mind or been referred to in my hearing for months before a few years ago this thing would have astounded me but the like could not much surprise me now though it happened every week for i think i know now that mind can communicate accurately with mind without the aid of the slow and clumsy vehicle of speech this age does seem to have exhausted invention nearly still it has one important contract on its hands yet the invention of the phrenophone that is to say a method whereby the communicating of mind with mind may be brought under command and reduced to certainty and system the telegraph and the telephone are going to become too slow and wordy for our needs we must have the thought itself shot into our minds from a distance then if we need to put it into words we can do that tedious work at our leisure doubtless the something which conveys our thoughts through the air from brain to brain is a finer and subtler form of electricity and all we need do is to find out how to capture it and how to force it to do its work as we have had to do in the case of the electric currents before the day of telegraphs neither one of these marvels would have seemed any easier to achieve than the other while i am writing this doubtless somebody on the other side of the globe is writing it too the question is am i inspiring him or is he inspiring me i cannot answer that but that these thoughts have been passing through somebody else's mind all the time i have been setting them down i have no sort of doubt i will close this paper with a remark which i found some time ago in boswell's johnson voltaire's candide is wonderfully similar in its plan and conduct to johnson's rasselas 
insomuch that i have heard johnson say that if they had not been published so closely one after the other that there was not time for imitation it would have been in vain to deny that the scheme of that which came latest was taken from the other the two men were widely separated from each other at the time and the sea lay between them postscript in the atlantic for june 1882 mr john fisk refers to the often quoted darwin and wallace coincidence i alluded just now to the unforeseen circumstance which led mr darwin in 1859 to break his long silence and to write and publish the origin of species this circumstance served no less than the extraordinary success of his book to show how ripe the minds of men had become for entertaining such views as those which mr darwin propounded in eighteen fifty eight mr wallace who was then engaged in studying the natural history of the malay archipelago sent to mr darwin as to the man most likely to understand him a paper in which he sketched the outlines of a theory identical with that upon which mr darwin had so long been at work the same sequence of observed facts and inferences that had led mr darwin to discovery of natural selection and its consequences had led mr wallace to the very threshold of the same discovery but in mr wallace's mind the theory had by no means been wrought out to the same degree of completeness to which it had been wrought in the mind of mr darwin in the preface to his charming book on natural selection mr wallace with rare modesty and candor acknowledges that whatever value his speculations may have had they have been utterly surpassed in richness and cogency of proof by those of mr darwin this is no doubt true and mr wallace has done such good work in further illustration of the theory that he can well afford to rest content with the second place in the first announcement of it the coincidence however between mr wallace's conclusions and those of mr darwin was very remarkable but after all coincidences of this sort have not been uncommon in the history of scientific inquiry nor is it at all surprising that they should occur now and then when we remember that a great and pregnant discovery must always be concerned with some question which many of the foremost minds in the world are busy thinking about it was so with the discovery of the differential calculus and again with the discovery of the planet neptune it was so with the interpretation of the egyptian hieroglyphics and with the establishment of the undulatory theory of light it was so to a considerable extent with the introduction of the new chemistry with the discovery of the mechanical equivalent of heat and the whole doctrine of the correlation of forces it was so with the invention of the electric telegraph and with the discovery of spectrum analysis and it is not at all strange that it should have been so with the doctrine of the origin of species through natural selection he thinks these coincidences were apt to happen because the matters from which they sprang were matters which many of the foremost minds in the world were busy thinking about but perhaps one man in each case did the telegraphing to the others the aberrations which gave leverrier the idea that there must be a planet of such and such mass and such and such an orbit hidden from sight out yonder in the remote abysses of space were not new they had been noticed by astronomers for generations then why should it happen to occur to three people widely separated leverrier mrs somerville and adams to suddenly go to worrying about those aberrations all at the same time and set themselves to work to find out what caused them and to measure and weigh an invisible planet and calculate its orbit and hunt it down and catch it a strange project which nobody but they had ever thought of before if one astronomer had invented that odd and happy project fifty years before don't you think he would have telegraphed it to several others without knowing it but now i come to a puzzler how is it that inanimate objects are able to affect the mind they seem to do that 
However, I wish to throw in a parenthesis first, just a reference to a thing everybody is familiar with. The experience of receiving a clear and particular answer to your telegram before your telegram has reached the sender of the answer. That is a case where your telegram has gone straight from your brain to the man it was meant for, far outstripping the wire's slow electricity, and it is an exercise of mental telegraphy which is as common as dining. To return to the influence of inanimate things, in the cases of non-professional clairvoyance examined by the physical society, the clairvoyant has usually been blindfolded, then some object which has been touched or worn by a person is placed in his hand. The clairvoyant immediately describes that person, and goes on and gives a history of some event with which the text object has been connected. If the inanimate object is able to affect and inform the clairvoyant's mind, maybe it can do the same when it is working in the interest of mental telegraphy. Once a lady in the West wrote me that her son was coming to New York to remain three weeks, and would pay me a visit if invited, and she gave me his address. I mislaid the letter, and forgot all about the matter till the three weeks were about up. Then a sudden and fiery eruption of remorse burst up in my brain that illuminated all the region round about, and I sat down at once and wrote to the lady and asked for that lost address. But upon reflection I judged that the stirring up of my recollection had not been an accident, so I added a postscript to say, never mind, I should get a letter from her son before night. And I did get it. For the letter was already in the town, although not delivered yet. It had influenced me somehow. I have had so many experiences of this sort, a dozen of them at least, that I am nearly persuaded that inanimate objects do not confine their activities to helping the clairvoyant, but do every now and then give the mental telegraphist a lift. The case of mental telegraphy which I am coming to now comes under I don't exactly know what head. I clipped it from one of our local papers six or eight years ago. I know the details to be right and true, for the story was told to me in the same form by one of the two persons concerned, a clergyman of Hartford, at the time that the curious thing happened. A remarkable coincidence. Strange coincidences make the most interesting of stories and most curious of studies. Nobody can quite say how they come about, but everybody appreciates the fact when they do come and it is seldom that any more complete and curious coincidence is recorded of minor importance than the following, which is absolutely true and occurred in the city. At the time of the building of one of the finest residences of Hartford, which is still a very new house, a local firm supplied the wallpaper for certain rooms, contracting both to furnish and to put on the paper. It happened that they did not calculate the size of one room exactly right, and the paper of the design selected for it fell short just half a roll. They asked for delay enough to send on to the manufacturers for what was needed, and were told that there was no special hurry. It happened that the manufacturers had none on hand, and had destroyed the blocks from which it was printed. They wrote that they had a full list of the dealers to whom they had sold that paper, and that they would write to each of these, and get from some of them a roll. It might involve a delay of a couple of weeks, but they would surely get it. In the course of time came a letter saying that, to their great surprise, they could not find a single roll. Such a thing was very unusual, but in this case it had so happened. Accordingly, the local firm asked for further time, saying they would write to their own customers, who had bought of that pattern, and would get the piece from them. But to their surprise, this effort also failed. A long time had now elapsed, and there was no use of delaying any longer. They had contracted to paper the room, and their only course was to take off that which was insufficient, and put on some other of which there was enough to go around. Accordingly, at length the man was sent out to remove the paper. He got his apparatus ready, and was about to begin work under the direction of the owner of the building, when the latter was for the moment called away. 
the house was large and very interesting and so many people had rambled about it that finally admission had been refused by a sign at the door on the occasion however when a gentleman had knocked and asked for leave to look about the owner being on the premises had been sent for to reply to the request in person that was the call that for the moment delayed the final preparations the gentleman went to the door and admitted the stranger saying he would show him about the house but first must return for a moment to that room to finish his directions there and he told the curious story about the paper as they went on they entered the room together and the first thing the stranger who lived fifty miles away said on looking about was why i have that very paper on a room in my house and i have an extra roll of it laid away which is at your service in a few days the wall was papered according to the original contract had not the owner been at the house the stranger would not have been admitted had he called a day later it would have been too late had not the facts been almost accidentally told to him he would probably have said nothing of the paper and so on the exact fitting of all the circumstances is something very remarkable and makes one of those stories that seem hardly accidental in their nature something that happened the other day brought my hoary manuscript to mind and that is how i came to dig it out from its dusty pigeonhole grave for publication the thing that happened was a question a lady asked it have you ever had a vision when awake i was about to answer promptly when the last two words of the question began to grow and spread and swell and presently they attained to vast dimensions she did not know that they were important and i did not at first but i soon saw that they were putting me on the track of the solution of a mystery which had perplexed me a good deal you will see what i mean when i get down to it ever since the english society for psychical research began its searching investigations of ghost stories haunted houses and apparitions of the living and the dead i have read their pamphlets with avidity as fast as they arrived now one of their commonest inquiries of a dreamer or a vision seer is are you sure you were awake at the time if the man can't say he is sure he was awake a doubt falls upon his tail right there but if he is positive he was awake and offers reasonable evidence to substantiate it the fact counts largely for the credibility of his story it does with the society and it did with me until that lady asked me the above question the other day the question set me to considering and brought me to the conclusion that you can be asleep at least wholly unconscious for a time and not suspect that it has happened and not have any way to prove that it has happened a memorable case was in my mind about a year ago i was standing on the porch one day when i saw a man coming up the walk he was a stranger and i hoped he would ring and carry his business into the house without stopping to argue with me he would have to pass the front door to get to me and i hoped he wouldn't take the trouble to help i tried to look like a stranger myself it often works i was looking straight at that man he had got to within ten feet of the door and within twenty-five feet of me and suddenly he disappeared it was as astounding as if a church should vanish from before your face and leave nothing behind it but a vacant lot i was unspeakably delighted i had seen an apparition at last with my own eyes in broad daylight i made up my mind to write an account of it to the society i ran to where the spectre had been to make sure he was playing fair then i ran to the other end of the porch scanning the open grounds as i went no everything was perfect he couldn't have escaped without my seeing him he was an apparition without the slightest doubt and i would write him up before he was cold i ran hot with excitement and let myself in with a latch-key when i stepped into the hall my lungs collapsed and my heart stood still for there sat that same apparition in a chair all alone and as quiet and reposeful as if he had come to stay a year the shock kept me dumb for a moment or two then i said did you come in at that door yes 
did you open it or did you ring i rang and the colored man opened it i said to myself this is astounding it takes george all of two minutes to answer the doorbell when he is in a hurry and i have never seen him in a hurry how did this man stand two minutes at that door within five steps of me and i did not see him i should have gone to my grave puzzling over that riddle but for that lady's chance question last week have you ever had a vision when awake it stands explained now during at least sixty seconds that day i was asleep or at least totally unconscious without suspecting it in that interval the man came to my immediate vicinity rang stood there and waited then entered and closed the door and i did not see him and did not hear the door slam if he had slipped around the house in that interval and gone into the cellar he had time enough i should have written him up for the society and magnified him and gloated over him and hurrahed about him and thirty yoke of oxen could not have pulled the belief out of me that i was of the favored ones of the earth and had seen a vision while wide awake now how are you to tell me when you are awake what are you to go by people bite their fingers to find out why you can do that in a dream end of mental telegraphy by mark twain read by john greenman